Hello and welcome back to another Aspects of Archaeology. Now today we're going to be talking about cognitive archaeology. Cognitive archaeology attempts to tackle a question which most archaeologists ask themselves from time to time. Archaeological excavations usually result in lots of finds and data. And whether it be during excavation or after all the finds have been cleaned and examined, archaeologists almost always come round to asking, what exactly does this mean? Why is it here? Some of these questions leave archaeologists scratching their heads, and this is because of the culturally specific nature of significance. Culturally significant symbols depend upon people knowing what they mean. They don't always look precisely like the object or thing which is being depicted. But without this cultural knowledge, archaeologists must find a way to translate the things that they find. In other words, the best way to figure out why something exists is to figure out the thoughts behind it. An archaeologist could turn to a psychic, but that's not exactly best practice. Alternatively, we could employ psychology, but often the people we are studying aren't around to be interviewed. Well, that must leave time travel the best way to go back and ask people what they were thinking. Come on, physicists, hurry up. And while we're waiting on physics, maybe we need to find another way to get inside the mind of people in the past. How best can we understand thought processes from many years ago. So we have rubbish and remains left behind from past cultures and people and we have the desire to understand how they thought. How then best can we proceed? How can we match up these remains with people's innermost thoughts? Well some archaeologists attempted to bridge the gap. Ah the 1980s. Big hair, spandex and post-processual archaeology. It was at this time that archaeologists such as Ian Hodder began digging not just into sites, but into mines. This process began by examining symbols, for example on pottery, and the way they are used. Archaeologists began to ask, why this pattern? Why here? Archaeologists began to examine how these symbols were produced, for example the different marks that were used to make them, and where they appeared and quickly it became apparent that in order to gain a deeper understanding of the symbols and the thoughts behind them, one had to understand where they fitted in the broader culture. The key word is context. Where something is in relation to other things tells you something about the thoughts behind it. An excellent extreme example of this is the swastika, universally known as a symbol of Nazi fascism. However, out of this cultural context, the swastika is a powerful symbol in the Hindu religion, not a symbol of evil. By examining and analysing the context of different objects, archaeologists could therefore begin to understand what they meant. Though it is worthwhile mentioning this is not a dictionary, it is still interpretation. In daily life, symbols are used to define our thoughts about place and the function of a place. We use symbols to measure the world around us, and indeed to measure ourselves. Symbols and their context allow us to convey ideas in the form of plans to other people in the world around us. Contextual symbols express relationships of power, for example, money. They are also used powerfully to express religious beliefs. Sometimes a symbol can be an iconic concept, such as Red Riding Hood, conveying a story or a riddle. Of course, letters, words and writing are most certainly symbols which we can use to understand people's thoughts. And along with this, there are the conventions which people use to represent the world around them, artistic styles, and also conventions in death, burial beliefs, burial ceremonies. These contextualised social symbols allow us to begin to get inside the head of people in the past. However, it is worthwhile mentioning that some archaeologists, such as Lewis Binford, believed that thoughts could not be seen in the archaeological record, only actions, even though actions are usually the result of thoughts. Despite the misgivings of certain archaeologists, such as Lewis Binford, cognitive archaeology did develop, particularly over the past decade. Here are some examples where cognitive archaeology has proved particularly useful. The West Kennet Longbarrow is a Neolithic tomb located near to Avebury in Wiltshire, England. For around a thousand years, Neolithic people tended this tomb and its very specific contents. In the passages within, bones were being sorted. 
Within the chambers, with the exception of the rearmost, archaeologists discovered a series of disarticulated human remains. These bones had been sorted into categories like ribs, skulls, long bones. And in total, around 46 individuals were represented, ranging from babies to the elderly, though some of the bones were missing. Archaeologists came to the conclusion that these bones were being periodically moved round, resorted, and even swapped from one location to another. To a modern mind, this does not necessarily make sense, so how best can we interpret it from a Neolithic standpoint? Well, given the treatment of the bones in a respectful but very particular way, it may have been that to the Neolithic mind, people in death were not people. Or rather, people weren't individuals, but rather part of a larger group. This may have been the same in life, but in death, quite literally, bones were interchangeable as one of the ancestors. Where we choose to see a family tree, they may have seen a whole ancestral conglomerate giving them identity and life. Cognitive archaeology is also used to study the evolution of the mind. For example, with Neanderthals, stone tools are extremely useful. Not least because these durable kernels of evidence survive over vast periods of time and usually are diagnostic of a Neanderthal site. These tools were elegant and complex and required a nuanced understanding in order to produce them. Because of this, they hint that Neanderthals may have had language in order to pass on this complicated concept. In this way, a stone tool is far more than a stone tool. It is an idea, and these ideas can be used to chart the progression and development of hominin minds over time. The Saxon tale of Beowulf is an epic of the Old English language, and before it was written down, it had been passed on for hundreds of years by the oral tradition. This is the tale of Beowulf and his stalwart friend Wiglaf and their band of thanes. They are called upon to fight the monstrous Grendel, a beast of the night. This demon is so feared because he has attacked the hall of Hrothgar, the king, the centre of society. Beowulf kills the beast, and we go on to hear of other battles in his life. This story has its roots in the peoples who migrated to Britain at the end of the Roman Empire. It is set in Denmark, and from it we get a sense of people talking proudly of their homeland. It was told in a time when the Romans had left Britain and famously left the island to look to its own defences. This was a time and place of danger. The Saxons lived in a world where Roman ruins were crumbling around them, succumbing to nature, and especially in the Fens, they lived amongst a watery, sparsely populated landscape. These villages were small, fairly isolated, and fairly vulnerable. And from the tale of Beowulf, we're reminded that wolves and other beasts would have represented real Grendels to be feared. There are areas and sites which do expose some of the weaknesses of cognitive archaeology, Stonehenge being a powerful one. For many years, people have discussed what is the meaning of this monument, and recently have gone back to thinking about solar festivals. Stonehenge is intensively researched, and yet still we are debating its meaning. This is largely because the cognitive approach is an interpretive approach, and the context of Stonehenge, and therefore its meaning, is still being uncovered. So, cognitive archaeology. It is an attempt to get inside the minds of people in the past, and also an attempt to chart the evolution of that mind from its beginnings to present day. It is an attempt to learn those things which we pick up in our daily lives through our acculturation in our particular social environments and we take for granted. Those things which are more easily lost than a broken pot. The point of view of people in the past. So there we have it, cognitive archaeology. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you found this video interesting and or useful. Feel free, incidentally, to subscribe or comment below or indeed send me a message and I shall get back to you as soon as is humanly possible. We do now have a Facebook page. Feel free to go onto Facebook, search for Archaeosuit Productions, click like and anything that doesn't make it onto the YouTube channel, such as news stories and the old cartoon, uh, will make it onto that wall and you'll be kept up to date. And also concurrently, there is in fact a Twitter page, which is uh, ooh, at Twitter. No, at Archeosuper, rather, <laughs> uh, which is uh, super spelt with a zero. 
Uh, also as well, feel free to go and check out archaeosoup.com. Yes, the wonderful flashy hub for all things archaeosoup. So, with all that said, and indeed having talked a bit about cognitive archaeology, I shall say goodbye. Until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>